So let me introduce Leopoldo Gutierrez, who will help me um, um, in, in your Q&A that I'm sure that you will have. And um, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, um, up right there. Thanks. Um, just on the first question, your EBIT, your sorry, your capex guidance for 2014 in UNE is much faster than it has been previously. Maybe you could give us an indication of whether you see that as a rate you expect to continue, um, and what it's being spent on. Mm -hmm. one? Yeah. Uh, up to now, UNE was investing a lot of in the 4G network that they had. What we plan going forward is to disinvest in that, in that line of business, leveraging on what we have on, on Tigo, and focus on investing and growing the network in, in HFC. So we don't expect uh, significant increases in the capex. We just see that we're going to focus that capex on HFC. Yeah, and I, I think in terms of the guidance we've given in my part of the, the presentation, you've got to understand that CapEx is not linear, particularly in a company like ours. Mm. It tends to be back-ended, so don't read anything just by grossing up that CapEx line. Okay, over here. Yes, I was going to ask you about the, uh, about, sorry, Lynn Osterberg from Carnegie. I was going to ask you about um, the uh, integration costs. Mm -hmm. If you could say a little bit more about uh, if you roughly expect the same amount, as you said before, and also the spacing over time, and also maybe a little bit about the synergies in terms of how long you think it will take to implement uh, the synergies. Mm -hmm. No, we will sustain what we said in the past in terms of integration costs. Um, I think that it's something that it didn't change. Be and, and the main reason to, to support this and also to answer the second part of your question is that basically what we are doing is to build this. One of the things that it was in the shareholder agreement I didn't mention yet was that we, as a managers, we had the commitment with our shareholders to present them in the next five months, and already, we already expand one, a three-year business plan, detailed. Yeah, so that is what we are building. Um, so I will expect to, to end that period to share with you all the numbers of the detailed, but nothing changed or from our former numbers. But could you say maybe something about the timing, uh, ah, in integration uh, yeah. and uh, synergies? No, uh, I, I, the same thing. As we have the plans, uh, we have this matrix with all the projects. We are now splitting that project in its uh, amount, the volume of the, each of them in terms of synergy and also in the time that we will get it. So we, I have no visibility yet in terms of uh, exactly a month. Some of them are really fast, are really quick. Uh, in a few quarters, you will see the results. Uh, and other of them, it would take uh, probably more than a year or two or something like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I mean, to be clear on this, and we said historically 105 million, and that will be spread over three years. And I think we haven't seen anything that changes our view on that at this stage. Mm -hmm. You know, my expectation will be that um, around about half of that will occur in the first year and then the rest of it tailed off over the next two to three years. But, you know, I caveat all of that by saying that Esteban and Leopoldo have just been in the business now for five, six weeks. You saw the number of programs that are out there that are being sort of carefully costed at this time. So, you know, I don't, I don't expect us to move away from those numbers, but, uh, you know, and this is big, but we're, we're really at the early stage on this at the moment. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, hello. Uh, so okay, no, well, hold sorry. on. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Stefan Gofang, uh, Nordea. Um, looking at the uh, EBITDA margin of UNA, it's 23%, and I believe that the uh, cable business of Melecom is around the 40% the level. Um, longer term, or say in 2017, should we expect UNA to be able to, to operate at around the 40% level? And especially uh, looking at EBITDA minus CapEx, uh, the group guidance is around 20%. Mm. Is that something that Colombia should be able to deliver? Mm. Without any doubt, we have a huge opportunity there to increase our EBITDA. 
That is a fact. I, I cannot deny it. In fact, I'm, I'm a guy who came from the cable business. I know perfectly that we have a huge gap there with the international benchmark at what we have today. But what I cannot deliver right now is when, and that is your question. Yes, and, and, and I love your question because everybody asks me the same everywhere. I think that my wife also asks me the same. <laughs> uh, but uh, I will need some, some time to, to really be honest, serious, and professional to share with you when we can do it. But I will keep my uh, commitment with the company, with the shareholders, that we can really achieve better, better mar benchmark that the market has internationally. Because it's no reason why to don't do it. So it will take some time, but we will deliver. And you also need to know that that FDA margin is impacted by the Greenfield LT project that UNE was launching. We intend to leverage that on the mobile side that we have already in Tigo. So that's going to have an impact eventually on that margin. about margins. Here is your A market of all your markets. Better growth, better GDP per capita, uh, wonderful diversification of the industry base, et cetera. Why won't the margins, in fact, be better than the rest of your margins anywhere else? I mean, you should be able to grow it faster and make them better. So my question is, if you're talking about cross-selling or complementary capital allocations or whatever, but basically, this should be a much better margin story than any other part, and so maybe you could explain why it isn't going to be. I mean, that's, that's a great intro to my budget meeting with these two guys tomorrow morning. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. I, I don't think we are saying that it isn't going to be. I think yeah. uh, the guys are saying this is going to take some time, yeah. but I mean, Esteban, you, you answer that. No, uh, let me understand better your question. You are meaning about Tigo, UNE, or the both of them? Combination. The combination, okay. Um, it's. it's uh, I really believe that we can be better than the, the benchmark, but it's a different question. What I was answering there is, I don't know yet when, yes? I think that we have all this, the, the, the skills to do it. Uh, in fact, I think that we know how we have to approach to the company, but we need some time to deploy a very detailed plan to share with you when we will arrive there. Yeah. Uh, but if you can see, and if you try, so if you like to see opportunities in the market, this is a huge one. Because when you see our margins, it's difficult to don't grow up our, mar uh, to don't grow our, our margins uh, in, in the future. Two point three no, as a total. One is one point three. Ah, yeah. One point three. One point three in two thousand thirteen. Yeah. What you need to know is that the website shows Colombian gap figures. We show IFRS figures, and the website shows UNE standalone. Here we show UNE plus the subsidiaries. So <coughs> one point three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Sven Schold from Swedbank. I'd like to continue on the margins in Colombia, of course. Um, and I'm wondering about uh, specifically, if you take the mobile business isolated, I mean, you're growing quite fast for the moment. So what do you expect in terms of margin improvements for that business standalone? Mm -hmm. And second, should we expect synergies to come on top of those potential higher margins in, say, two or three years when growth maybe fade and margins maybe rise? Yeah, on the still standalone basis, it's a matter of scale. Uh, our margins are lower than the competitors, first, because we don't have a fixed mobile combination as they do, but secondly, because of the scale that we have, we're much smaller than they are. Uh, with the growth that we've shown over the past two years, margins have increased. Uh, we don't provide uh, margins country by country, but I can assure you that margins have increased over the past two years, and we expect them to continue growing. Mm -hmm. But what, what do you think the margin potential is? I mean, this is a third player, so it's not going to be 50%, right? But could it be like 35 or uh, for that business down alone? You know, we, we've got a, a margin target for the group as a whole at 35%. For us to achieve that, Colombia has to drive, you know, a big part of that. It, it, you know, so, <clears throat> so whether we'll get that business to 35, I'm not saying that, but it is going to be a major part and it, and it will drive the business. Now, you know, the, the margins to some extent are lower at the present time because of the investment we're making in it. You know, we're investing very heavily in our customer acquisition, and that is taking, what, something like six, seven percentage points off our margin simply because we're reinvesting in the, in the customer. 
you know, that will uh, ease off over time. But, uh, you know, I, I think the message really here is that this is a great opportunity. Um, and over the long term, we think this will, to Bill's earlier point, you know, exceed uh, industry standards, but not in the short term. And also it's true that the, the, the market is changing at this time. Um, because we have a, a different scenario there with uh, new regulations and a lot of things that it changed and also provide us and you will see the uh, different um, uh, scale in the or not different scale a different business that we I think that we took very very well the, that advantage so you will see the number probably that team will share with you maybe not today but in the next world and it will be fantastic something that you are waiting for Matthias. Thank you. Uh, I have three questions. Uh, number one, the net promoter score, the latest reading, if you compare Tigo versus Claro. Uh, the second question is how, how large share of UNES workforce is unionized? And the third question is if you take the call center part of the UNES business, how large share of sales and EBTA, EBTA is that? Okay. Well, let's start for the union one. Uh, I think that is a very, very important question, Matthias. Um, one of the fears that the people feel in, in when we went into the company was, uh, I would say from the both side, um, all this uh, employee environment will change and how they will manage this thing. I have to say that we have different unions inside of UNE. Um, I have a large, large experience in unions. I came from Argentina, imagine. Um, and there, um, something that uh, already did was I met with the, the two most important unions that we have. In fact, the only one, two, that we recognize as a union. Um, and I was really surprised because they are really professional. They, they really want to, to find a company who will su support the long-term uh, um, business. And that was their concern, uh, mostly. The both of them says, that this was a part of the period that they were just uh, opposing this because they, they didn't understand. But also now they realize that we have a future, that we have a plan. It will be a better opportunity for our employees and everything. So I really think that um, we have a union or uh, unions that we can work together and we can build a future together. So until now, um, the, the only thing that I have to say there is there are positive ones. Um, we have a union that is over our direct employees. So it's not from half of the company who are indirect. Yes. So they are also give us the chance to manage the size of the company as we require. Yeah. So that is the first one. The second one, Matthias, was? Net promoter score. Do you remember that number? No, I think it's around 50, 55 yeah. compared to Claro, which is basically even at zero. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Movistar, which yeah. is, I think, around seven. Yeah, but we have, yeah, for the mobile side, yeah. We have a huge gap there. And in fact, when I mentioned that the brand is half, the brand has a very good performance, is because our customers perceive, and also the customer for our competitors, that we have a very good network, a very good service, a very good healthy brand, and we have a lot of focus in the digital arena, that means music and all these things. So it was really, really good. And we keep, we hope that we will continue doing in that track. One of our competitors launched their brand, I don't know, two years ago. Um, they did a huge investment there. Um, and after a while, we performed really, really well, and we keep performing really well, so. In terms of Entelco, it's, it's not material, because 85% of the transactions that they do is related either to UNE or to, or to Tigo. So whatever revenue is remaining is, is, is not material to, to the size of the company or to, to the margins. Can we get a microphone? Yeah. Summit over here. Hi, it's um, Sumit Data from New Street Research. Um, uh, on UNE, I think over half the company today is DSL infrastructure. Um, and less than 50% cable. Can you talk a little bit about the different um, network investment requirements and challenges of both those infrastructures? Thank you. Mm. 
Yes, when, when I mentioned that we need to put some focus in the company, I think that is one of the key areas that we have. Um, because if you go through the company, what we have is a lot of different infrastructures and networks. Um, we, uh, Xavier was supporting me last week in Colombia. Xavier is our CTIO of, of Millicom. And we already assessed that we have a copper network, of course, HFEC. We have fiber. We, they have a small group of g -Pond network. They have also 2600 spectrum where they run 4G. And um, in a few of the subsidiaries, we have also have a spectrum in 900. So one of the things, our main focus today, to go straight to the question or direct to your question, is to manage the spectrum that we have in 2600. That is something that we need to solve. Yes. And there we already have 300,000 customers uh, in the 4G arena, and we want to, or we will build a plan, and we are working on build a plan uh, that where we will move it. That's it. Uh, let's go to the back. Hi, Esteban and Leopoldo. JP Milsat from Dodge and Cox. It sounds like you have a lot to do. I'm just wondering, are you, I mean, the people you have in place looks like maybe you're not people constrained anymore. Are you capital constrained? And what's the funding philosophy for Columbia going forward? I think that internally for the time being, we generate enough cash in both operations to reinvest in the business. And on the mobile side, I don't, I don't think we will need more external funding. We need to refinance a little bit what we have right now, but we don't foresee the need for capital. On the cable side, once we focus on the right technology, which I think is going to be HFC to, to deploy the network, we would reallocate the capital that we generate internally to reinvest in that. So I think we, we, we will be self-sustainable going forward. And, and I think from a group position, I mean, we, you know, we, firstly, we echo that. But secondly, you know, we, we believe that this is one of the places where we can make the biggest return on capital. So you know, we won't be constraining our capital allocation to... Uh, to Colombia. Hi, Gonzalo Fernandez here from RBC. Um, could you give us a quick update on the competitive dynamics in Colombia? I believe uh, ETB is rolling out fiber and intends to launch mobile. AMX is upgrading the network. Maybe you can comment a bit on competition going forward. Thanks. Yeah, um, probably you know that uh, Colombia is, one the, is the second one largest market concentrated in the world uh, after Mexico. Uh, and that is a fact. Yeah. So one of the things that is complex in Colombia is to compete, compete, to compete with someone who is so big. Yes. But we find the way. And the way was through the digital lifestyle, and through the customer experience, through the network, through all the things that we highlight today in my presentation. Some of our competitors, as ETV, that was our former partner until two months ago, and well, one of the companies that we have a very, very good relation, they, are, they have their own plans as fitted um, fiber to the home that they already start to deploy. And also, they, are, we, uh, they have a type of MBNO over our network in, this, in the 4G spectrum. So, but, um, so I would say that the environment, it's a quite good in the sense that when you have a concentrate market, you also have the chance to challenge that big one, yes, and to get a part of them. Yes, and that is our focus, but not through the, the and, and a competition in terms of aggressiveness or, or to do a lot of things. So it's a competition that we are focused on the customer. As Mario mentioned, this was a company that grew up a lot through the years, uh, and our focus was on a lot of things and a leader of customer, but now we realize, and, and in fact, was what we did in the last two years and a half, three years was to have a very, very good knowledge of our, about our customers. And that is what we are doing there, beyond our competitors. It is also a very regionalized country, as you saw, and as Esteban mentioned about our position in the coast with Tigo and our position with UNE in Medellin. So we try to compete differently in the different areas and in the different business, and that will provide us a lot of opportunity to grow in certain regions, protecting in some of the regions, but opportunities to grow in others. Okay, we have a question already. Thank you, Thomas Heath here with Handelsbanken. A few questions, if I may. Uh, firstly, on brand, have you decided uh, where you'll be going uh, in Colombia going forward? Secondly, on margins, uh, the 2013 uh, slide you show shows 23.3. 
uh, and the numbers you given for 2014 here imply 21.8. Uh, is this the uh, is there a deterioration in the in the base business, or how much is the the 4G rollout in UNE applying there? And thirdly, then. Uh, on, on the network and network quality, there's a lot of fixed line in UNE. Do you see a need to replace parts of the network to enable uh, faster broadband and so forth? Thank you. I will take the first. That is another wife question that they always do. Uh, the brand, it's, it's very, very important. But we have a very good thing there that they both brands are really health. Uh, they have a very good performance. If you compare these with different mergers that they went in the industry or in the past, I can mention, I don't know, Calvisión and Multicanal, as I said, I was working there. In fact, I worked in marketing for more than 10 years. Um, they took from 2006 to 2010 of 2009, I think, that they changed the, and they chose their brand that it was Calvisión. Um, the same thing in Abnet. We bought Abnet in 2008, and we finalized, decide to move to Tigo and 2011, so it took more or less three years, because both brands were really healthy. Also, you can compare with other industries, like uh, the, the avi aviation industry. It uh, was Avian Cataca, for example, that was a merch, a very, very important merch in Colombia. Uh, after three years, they chose the brand that is finally, it's Avianca. So I think that we don't need to rush. We have no any agreement there. What we will do is we will search and we will assess what brand represents better the products and the services that we want to offer to the customer through the time. And after that, we will deploy the, or we will choose a brand and we probably will do a beautiful event to launch that brand to the market. So that is what we are planning to do. I think on the, the margin question, I mean, you're basically taking it from the guidance I'm giving in my uh, presentation in terms of the contribution to, um, to the group for the rest of this year. And, you know, I'd urge you not to view that as guidance on Columbia uh, long term. That really is just giving you a view because you don't have it as to what it will do to our group margins. And, you know, we don't see a change in the margin pattern but we do see a stub period where you're not going to get a, a you're not going to get a linear uh, margin um, uh, or EBITDA contribution. And secondly, as you'd expect, just taking a new business, you know, we've made some contingency planning in terms of additional costs that we may have or some additional running. So this is not meant to be guidance for Columbia long term. This is really the impact on the group for the remainder of this year. And I'll talk about the impact on margins for the group uh, in, in my presentation later on. Was there a third question? Yeah. There was a p p possible need to replace parts of the network. No, uh, we don't see anything of that yet. Uh, we don't find anything. The networks are running well. Of course, the, the margins of the cost of run, of run different networks, it's, it's different for each network. But uh, we don't see anything that we are worried about it. We are. We are having very, very good services. One of that, or a few of that companies, uh, as um, Edatel or um, um, ETP, they have a total different network. They are based on Cooper, in Cooper because the, that was uh, the, the incumbent telephony company in the area. Of course, where we are overlapping the networks, we will choose the best of the, 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 the more cost efficiency network to, to, to use. But nothing massive, nothing that we are worried about it, nothing that uh, we have to consider as an important point in our CAPEX for the future years. UNE has already 3 million home passes, and those home passes are in HFC. So we don't, we don't see a, a problem with the copper that we have right now. If, if the growth that we plan going forward is going to be on HFC. But it's not a replacement mm -hmm. of the copper, it's rather growth. No. I think that is. No, no. Yeah, I think Thanks. It's Nick Brown at Goldman Sachs. If I can just clarify on that point. So the 3 million move to 5 million homes passed, that's all going to be organic investment in HFC. And there won't be any replacement of the existing DSL network for HFC. Correct. Basic Correct. 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 It's basically like that. Yeah. The, the, remember that this is an incumbent telecom company that started in copper. That's why UNE has copper. That's why they have so many fixed telephony customers. But the growth they started investing many years ago in HFC, which is pretty much everything is two-way, so it's prepared to offer TV, broadband, and, and fixed telephony as well. So as we grow in, in, in new markets, we do it through HFC, 
And when we need to put HFC on top of copper, we do if the, if the payback's appropriate. Okay, any more questions? Well, I think we are probably just about ready for lunch. So, okay. uh, <laughs> one hour. <laughs> one hour for lunch. Yeah. Nicholas, okay. do you want to, where is the lunch? Okay. Outside, okay? Back in an hour, guys, thank you. Thank you very much.